Hello and welcome to the Get Lit Festival. I'm Kate Peterson, Director of Get Lit Programs, a nonprofit housed within Eastern Washington University. Get Lit is a week-long celebration of literature traditionally held in Spokane, Washington. This year, all of our events are virtual and virtually all of them are free. To learn more about Get Lit, to find this year's schedule of events or to donate, please click on the link below to visit our website, getlitfestival.org. Now I'd like to introduce Claire Walla, Get Lit's Assistant Coordinator. Thanks, Kate, and thank you all for joining us for Transformative Justice, Uncaging Creativity. We're joined by two renowned artists, both of whom will share stories and experiences of America's prison system, as well as insights into how our country can move past its current ethos of mass incarceration, citivism, and move toward healing and transformation through creativity and the power of the written word. We're also thrilled to be joined by Eastern Washington University professor, Dr. Martin Meraz Garcia, will moderate this conversation and whom we'll introduce first. Dr. Martin Meraz Garcia is a professor in Chicanx studies at Eastern Washington University. His areas of specialization include international relations, political psychology, and criminal justice. He has over 10 years of experience teaching in the area of Chicanx studies, and his most recent publications include The Role of Female Combatants in the Nicaraguan Revolution, and counter-revolutionary war and perceptions of college among Latina, Latino elementary students, among others. Dr. Meraz Garcia is a McNair Scholar alumnus, a McNair Scholar mentor, a scholar activist, and a dreamer advocate. Up next is the musician and artist Speech, leader of the two-time Grammy award-winning hip hop collective, Arrested Development. He and the group have been, a, have been a groundbreaking force in hip hop culture since 1991. Their debut album, Three Years, Five Months, and Two Days in the Life Of, sold over four million albums, earned two Grammy Awards, two MTV Awards, a Soul Train Music Award, and the coveted NAACP Image Award. Speech has continued to be a trailblazer within the group and as a solo artist. In 2018, Speech visited a Richmond, Virginia jail for 10 days to work with inmates, encouraging the men to tell their stories through the art of music. The project was documented in a film called 16 Bars, which is available across multiple streaming platforms. We're also joined by Marlon Peterson, an inspiration whisperer, author, criminal legal system expert, and public speaker. He's the founder and CEO of the Precedential Group Social Enterprises and the host of the Decarcerated Podcast. Ebony Magazine named Marlon one of the 100 most inspiring leaders in the Black community, and his TED Talk, Am I Not Human? A Call for Criminal Justice Reform has amassed over 1.2 million views. His writing has been published in various media outlets, including The Nation, USA Today, Ebony, Essence, Gawker, The Good Men Project, and others. He has also contributed essays to Kiese Lehman's book, How to Slowly Kill Yourself and Others in America, Akiba Solomon and Kenria Rankin's How to Fight White Supremacy, and Colin Kaepernick's Medium series, Abolition for the People. Marlon's first book, Bird Uncaged, an Abolitionist's Freedom Song, was published just this week by Bold Type Books. We're happy to welcome you all into this virtual space. And before we hand it over to Dr. Moraz Garcia, we'd first like to invite Marlon to read from his memoir. So Marlon, the floor is yours. Oh, Thank sorry, Mar oh, good. Yeah, I'm here, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to be in this space with you all. I'll read from the last chapter of the book. Un-American and free. Fuck prison. Seven days before I was released, my sleeping area was ransacked by COs in search of something. I'm still unsure of what. A former Bridging the Gap participant, a Vassar College student, sent me a Vassar lettered hoodie as a gift to wear home. It was December, so warm clothes made sense. The hoodie triggered the prison administration suspicion that I was having inappropriate relationships with the bachelor students and that I was getting favors from them. Sergeant Shaborn had his officers confiscate every letter, picture, and journal entry I had in my sleeping area. They left my remaining clothes and books alone. They wanted to invade the most intimate parts of me, the sacred layers. After several days of reading letters sent to me in journal entry from the decade of my 20s, a CO, a chubby 30-something-year-old white man named Conklin, who always wore his dingy 
D-O-C-C-S baseball cap, returned my belongings and jeeringly said, Peterson, you gave a fuck. You really did give a fuck. But why didn't you write about me? People like this officer are why I take a personal affront to law enforcement when they speak to me as if I'm a toy to be played with. They had all the evidence to prove that their suspicions were wrong, but they didn't care about evidence. They had a preconceived notion about people like me that no amount of evidence could disprove. Six days before my freedom date, Sergeant Shaborn had me escorted to his office where he told me, the Lord must be on your side because if you had a little more time left, I would lose you in the system. Fuck him and his belief in my worst possibilities. Despite my living a life inside where people kept instilling hope in me, he wanted to keep me in prison based on an idea he had in his head. He wanted to keep me away from my mother, father, sister, brother, and nephew for an idea he had in his head. Prison didn't want to let me go. A couple of hours before my release, I wrote my final journal entry from prison. So it's 2 a.m. and in six to seven hours, I'll be out of prison. Am I ready? Absolutely. Nervous? Absolutely not. Devon, Mikey, and Kells are coming to pick me up. This part of my life is over and the next stage begins. Jehovah God, thank you. I did not become the stereotype person in prison. No fights, no beasts, no drugs, no gangs. Smarter, wiser, more secure. A better man. Strong, stronger family ties. Better friends. I've conquered prison. I will be successful. I will break barriers. I will inspire. I will because it is what I ought to do. And 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. Jia, my sabbatical is finished. My new life begins. Stay tuned. Peace and love to the people harmed by our collective act of violence in 1999. December 23rd, 2009 was the most anticlimactic day of my entire 3,722 days in prison. Nothing felt different to me. The CO covering my housing unit asked why I didn't seem excited about going home. I don't remember my answer, but I do recall wondering, how should I be acting right now? I was 19 years old when I went away my freedom would forever be connected to the death of innocent people. I knew that I'd always be considered an ex-con. How many times would I have to prove to people that I was no longer that 19-year-old boy? Would I be wrong if part of me wanted to experience my 20th, my 19th, my 20th, 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th, and 30th birthday out of prison? Did I deserve to imagine freedom? The four people shot, the two, the, two, the two who died, the neighborhood that was traumatized by the shooting, they all suffer still. Sometimes I get a horrid taste in my mouth when I hear people spew about mass incarceration or mass deportation and criminal justice reform. Everyone likes to quote Brian Stevenson's, I believe that each person is more than the worst thing they've ever done. But no one ever thinks about how difficult it is for the person who committed, to, who committed the wrong to believe that they aren't forever wrong. I imagine the impact to believe, excuse me, I imagine the impact of my decisions on the people who were sitting in that restaurant, the people who were running in the streets when the shooting happened, the mothers who lost their sons that day, the immigrant worker who probably didn't have enough health insurance to fully pay for their healing. I know I didn't shoot anyone, but I remember wanting to have a gun with me that day. Why was I so broken that I could volunteer to carry a deadly weapon to a robbery? I had never shot anyone. So why, so why was I so eager to be in a position to shoot someone, someone I'd never seen or knew existed? In the years that followed my release, I implemented HALA, a youth organization in two schools in Brooklyn, worked as a violence interrupter in my own Crown Heights neighborhood, mentored and spoke to thousands of kids like myself from Brooklyn to Durban, South Africa published essays in some amazing publications, gave a TED talk that amassed over a million views and helped my boy Kilo Cumberbatch out of immigration detention. I have loads of awards from organizations and politicians for my work in my community. I got a degree from NYU. People send me emails and direct messages on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter to tell me how much they have been inspired by some aspect of my work. 
I got receipts. And for all of this, I am in deep gratitude. When I travel to other countries, I insert time to bask in the blessing that I have been bestowed. But the prison I've had the hardest time identifying and abolishing is the one that convinced me that I do not deserve to be happy. The happiness is a fleeting moment, but never a movement. I guess that's why my smiling in pictures is revolutionary. The opponent is every horrible experience I've had, every lie that I've believed in, and everyone I've told lugs, excuse me, and everyone I have told lugs along as though it's attached to my ankle like a ball and chain. Lies have been my most despotic captor. Even in this book, I have lied. Until now, I have until now I, I omitted that at 18, I beat and hung a dog and came, and came close to shooting it while, I was, while it was crying. I conveniently left out that I have never been faithful or, or entirely truthful to any woman who has ever loved or lusted for me. I was a good guy, fuck boy. I was actively a piece of shit to others. And as much as I needed to be fully seen as human, I was denying the women in my life that same humanity to be seen as more than the object with which I could be selfish about comfort and comfortable with being at my worst about lying the footnote nature of this admission the footnote nature of this admission is proof that i have struggled with the comfort of the victim role i daydream about my death as an event when i will get to hear people speak about the way i have positively impacted their lives that's some narcissistic shit nothing is balanced out here it's not excusable for a victim to be a perpetrator or for the perpetrator to claim victimhood but they are realities these polarities exist in every moment. I didn't tell you that Marlon is still scared and uncomfortable with smiling in pictures. I've wanted not to exist more times than I've wanted to live and so, and no child should ever think about invisibility as a way out of the day. Neither should any adult. I never attempted, attempted suicide, but I thought about it a lot and sometimes I still think about it. This is what prison feels like, trapped. I think about death from the police, death from somebody in the street, and sometimes by accident. I'm a black person in America, so this ain't only me. I wanted to write it out because I wanted to heal. I want to end all the prisons that bind us. We need to abolish lies, the ones that we tell and the ones we are told. Our imaginations can only become, excuse me, our imaginations can become a reality only when we are freer and more honest. There are 2.3 million people in actual prisons in America, almost 400,000 locked in immigration and custom enforcement detention centers, over 70 million people in the US with a criminal conviction, and over 4.5 million under some form of state supervision, including e-carceration. Yo, we digitizing incarceration. What does it say about a society that basks in the peace of captivity? America is an incarcerated republic. And I've told you before that I, that I do not believe in prisons of any kind. That is why I aim to be a better un-American. For so long, I have hidden pain, consciously hurt others and survived in the deceit of it all. That's why, excuse me, that's what we men do. This is how we define my manhood. Phrases like men don't cry, men don't show emotion or men are tough promote unevolved customs and they are still embedded in the ethos of America. I don't think of America in a gendered binary. I experience this nation as a, as a charismatic group of a man. American patriotism is American patriarchy. And I don't want to pledge any allegiance to that. I don't want to keep that kind of company anymore. America, he hurts people all over the world every day. And I mean he because our war performance of malignant masculinity is what makes America so great in the eyes of the world. Not every country was created by war and written oppression and the written oppression of most of its citizens. Not every country in the world gained its wealth through the brazen brutality of slavery, war, colonialism, and dogged capitalism. Therein lies the ethos of American exceptionalism. But just like me, America is enveloped in emotional deadness, apathetic to the hurt it is causing in plain sight. America is a cauldron of weakness that harms Black people, immigrants, and women to protect itself from the foibles of its foundation a foundation built on an ideal of white supremacy that has no real grounding. White supremacy is fake as fuck, but it feels so good. The details are in the deception. And this is the uh, two more paragraphs. I was, being an, an, I was being an American. I was complicit in the idea of white supremacy, an idea that white people incarnate, but is not exclusive to white skin. The idea that difference is threatening to personal existence, 
that pain can be forgotten without being acknowledged, that personal freedom can exist without collective honesty and commitment to healing. In so many ways, I am still an American. I am most fittingly an unproud un-American American. I understand the privileges American citizenship affords me. I get not to be harassed by law enforcement, lie. I get not to be marginalized because of my skin color, lie. I get access to the best public school education in the world, lie. I get to live in a country that is free of domestic terrorism, lie. I get to live in a country where the electoral process is fair and uncorrupted. Hold up, that's not right because of gerrymandering, voter suppression, and that's still an election thing that happened back in 2000 when Al Gore won, but Bush, Bush Jr. got the court, not the electorate to crown him king. So yes, I'm an unproud, un-American American. I don't, pledge I don't pledge allegiance to people that won't do the same for me. Why would I act differently for a nation that doesn't love me or the people I care about? I'll stop this. Thank you. So is this where, where I come in, I'm assuming, right? Um, so uh, thank you, uh, uh, Marlon, for uh, that awesome uh, read of, of your uh, uh, biography. Um, I was just uh, reminded of the parallels between, of course, uh, the, the read that you just did right now and the uh, documentary 16 Bars. Obviously, that's, that's you know, probably reasons why we're, uh, you both uh, were invited here. Um, you know, I, I just wanted to, to talk a little bit about, uh, I guess, um, discuss when, when, I, when I hear, when I was listening or when I was watching the documentary and listening to the songs uh, that uh, were being composed and recorded uh, by the inmates in the, pre in the prison, I, 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 I thought about the article um, I published on Arco Ballads. Um, where I document the negative influence on, on narco corridos. Um, and um, in our most recent publications um, that, that you heard titled uh, The Role of Female Combatants in the Nicaraguan Revolution and Counter-Revolutionary War, we documented the positive influence of music and musicians um, in toppling a dictator uh, in Nicaragua. Um, there are other examples that we can cite uh, where music uh, and artists that, or literal, literary works uh, like the ones that you just read uh, now have tremendous influence on uh, their audience. Um, so you both just cited, uh, you know, uh, 4 million um, albums uh, sold, for example, uh, uh, 1.2 million views uh, on the Tech Talk. Um, so can you both talk a little bit about the influence of uh, music um, and or films, uh, documentaries, um, uh, and how, um, just talk a little bit about the influence on the audience, both good, because obviously this could be, a, 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 you know, um, could be both, uh, positive or negative influence. Uh, I mean, that's what music and that's really with, with any, any tool that we employ to, you know. Uh, so, so can you talk a little bit about uh, that influence um, in which music and or literary works, um, um, you know, have had in their audience? I'll, I'll, I can go. I, I want to, I want to get, you know, speech. First of all, I'm honored to be in conversation with speech. Just, just got to say that <laughs> and just got to throw that out there. Um, everyday people. Um, uh, but, but for me, without question, actually the, you know, one of the initial titles of this book, we ended up working through it was um, Bird and Cage Promise to Sing About Me. And that's based off a of Kendrick Lamar song, um, Sing About Me, Dying of Thirst. Um, and if you write, write to my writing, you can't see it. I actually have a steel pen. So I'm of Trinidadian uh, descent and a steel pen has played a great role. And I mean, it's, I write about this in the book actually in terms of like how music helped get me through prison. Now, I didn't have access to a steel pen in prison, but I had access to a, uh, you know, we had Walkmans. And for those who <laughs> might be too young, you don't know what a Walkman is. <laughs> Little small thing that you put, you know, cassette tapes in. But you know, we had access to, um, uh, to Walkmans and, you know, it was literally how, you know, I, I started my writing career probably before prison, but I definitely enhanced it while I was inside. And I would write 
with music in my ear. And it was because I needed the rhythm of it all, but it also took me out of the place. You know, in some ways it gave me sort of like a, it gave me a level of freedom that like reading a, the, written, the written word can give me at different times. Um, and it, it plays such a huge role. Like I have a photo album from, you know, when people had sent me pictures while I was inside, I still actually have the actual photo album. And in the back of the photo album, I have um, the albums, the, like the jacket covers of the albums, the cassette tapes that got me through, some of the ones that got me through that I was able to bring out. Yeah, music is, and I, you know, outside of that, I'm just sort of thinking about in a larger conversation, I think particularly, you know, diasporically black folks, music is, is one of not only our superpower, but it's one of our forms in which we get freedom and how we resist. You think to South Africa, right? You think about Mary McKeever, like these, these music was, wasn't just a, wasn't a side thing. It wasn't just music in the background. It was, it was the movement. Right, so without question, I think when you think about carceral spaces, freedom, you know, freedom spaces, people who are fighting for freedom, whether it be in places like an apartheid South Africa or an apartheid America or inside of prisons, particularly for black and brown folks, music is instrumental, it's, it's essential to the work. Um, first of all, thank you, Marlon, just for sharing what you shared. Thank you for the, the love for what, what I do and, and you know just giving me love on sharing this space with you. I watched your TED talk and I was so moved by it. And just the chapter that you read or part of the chapter you read now just moved me so much. And to answer your um, initial question, Martine, is, is music for black people and brown people is as as Marlon just stated, it's really part of our historical passing down of information. I mean, from griots to storytellers to musical, you know, drums being part of our actual form of communication. It reaches across barriers and obstacles that religion many times cannot reach over. That politics cannot reach over. It enables us to communicate throughout the planet. And for black people, to my knowledge, it is our biggest export. It is what we are able to disperse or distribute throughout the entire planet. I've been through various continents and even in the most remote areas, people may not know a lot of the television shows that are going on in America. They may not know a lot of the politics that are going on and the nuance that are going on in America, but they will know the music. And for black people in particular, being a minority, also being oppressed and marginalized to the extent that we have been, music becomes for us a way to connect. It becomes way bigger as Marlon just stated than just entertainment. It becomes, as I said, an export. It becomes our news. It becomes to some extent our scripture as sort of Marlon was alluding to, to some extent, like the various things that kept him motivated. It becomes for us way much more than just mere entertainment. And so, yes, to, to answer that question, I think that music is so profound and revolutionary music, music that is about fundamental change. It's one of the most honest mediums that one can use to speak revolutionary concepts. It is one of the most um, emotionally powerful that people react to it emotionally, not just intellectually. And it becomes one of the most effective, whether it be at the time that the music was released or over generations. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very, convicted about the power of music, what it's done for me, but also what it does for millions upon millions and billions of people across the world. And I'm a big believer in its ability to um, play a huge role in the freedom of people, marginalized people throughout the world, and especially for Black people. Thank you so much. Um, this uh, really uh, reminded me of uh, when we were uh, doing interviews uh, for our book, uh, we interview, uh, obviously, I, I, I'm very much attuned to the power of me. I, um, you know, and for that reason, obviously, when we were uh, doing these interviews, uh, 
we went uh, after uh, to, to interview this musician, very influential musician that played a key role during the Nicaraguan revolution uh, in the 1960s and 70s. And in fact, he was exiled from the country, uh, had to go to Spain because um, the influence of his lyrics were such that it became dangerous uh, for the dictator at that time to, you know, uh, to allow him to stay. Um, and, and, you know, in, in fact, uh, I, I have a, a lecture that I titled The Power of Music, uh, and, and I, I share with my students. Um, you, you mentioned a couple of things here uh, when individuals connected emotionally, intellectually, and I share with them a song that um, I was listening to. So I remember, uh, you know, the day, the place where I was when I was listening uh, for the first time uh, this song that talked about uh, the immigrant experience in the United States. Uh, and, and, and so, so very much I, I, I feel, uh, you know, what, what, what you're saying. And, and, you know, we, we also talked about basically what you just uh, shared. Uh, the power of music is, is such, it's, 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 it's a form of resistance. It's a form of communication. It's a form of, uh, and, and, you know, uh, we go back. Uh, in fact, we have a similar thing called a corrido, which is, very much just describe it's a form of communication this was in fact the way people communicated when they when they couldn't read newspapers so there's a lot of uh, similarities here that, that that i see um so uh, what i i wanted to to transition into the second question uh what about the role um that you both think uh or the responsibility of musicians uh, filmmakers uh writers uh, have on matters of concerns uh, or of concern in a democracy, such as you mentioned voting rights, uh, LGBTQ plus uh, rights, uh, police brutality, mass incarceration of people of color, et cetera. Can you share a little bit about um, that responsibility as an artist? Uh, uh, you know, what is it? I'd like to speak real quickly, and I'm sure Marlon has some thoughts on this. For me personally, I believe that music needs to be um, purposeful and reactive and um, it needs to respond to what is going on at the time. So if things are pretty great, then I think the music should respond to that and, and should reflect that. But if things are not, and for Black people for quite a long time now, we have been underneath mounds of oppression, centuries of, of racism and white supremacist ideas and, uh, and, and um, propaganda. And so the music, in my opinion, needs to respond to the call of the moment. Um, Nina Simone said it, uh, Bob Marley said it, Bob Marley said music is a weapon. Nina, Nina Simone said something, I'm paraphrasing, but said basically that she felt a deep responsibility as long as the oppression was obvious, that she felt a deep responsibility as an artist to respond to that oppression with songs of freedom and liberation. Um, Fela Kuti, so many others have this tradition, whether it be Public Enemy and hip hop or X-Clan or Arrested Development, this tradition of responding to what is viscerally attacking you in, in the present day. So I believe that music must do that. Does every single artist need to have that view? Of course not, because that doesn't reflect how humanity works. Mm -hmm. But I think that those of us who are conscious enough of what is going on around us and have that that gift to be able to speak as just Marlon spoke through his book, I think it behooves everyone in humanity and especially the people that you speak for to speak up and say something of importance that responds to the, to the oppressions of your time and of your day. Not only is it good for the people living in your, in your time with you, but it's good for those who will study you in the years and decades and centuries to come to understand what were the views and realities that were going on at that time. So they can hopefully learn from um, the times that we're even living in at this point. 
And one other thing, I do get concerned with the corporate run um, realities of music in this, this day and age. Music used to be a lot more controlled by music lovers, those that were the recipients of the music. They helped to control the music. They helped to what we call in the industry, breaking a record. They helped to break records. They would locally put a record on on their local station and locally have that be exposed to then a regional response. And then from regional to a national response, an international response. These things because of technology and because of corporate conglomerates are unfortunately being controlled by less and less people. The problem with that is those people many times do not have the heart of the, the masses in mind and they're only thinking about money and profit and therefore messages are being snuffed out. And that's what I see a lot of examples of in today's music industry as opposed to what I experienced in the early 90s and as opposed to what I experienced prior to my group blowing up um, in the 70s, 80s and so on and so forth. And even in the 60s, as you mentioned, Martine. So I think that there does need to be change in the laws so that the music can flourish and voices like Marlon's, like my own, and so many millions of others can be heard and, and um, in a more you know, broad way in, in today's society. Yeah, yeah, I want to jump in. Thanks for that. Because I also, you know, as I was listening to you speak, uh, speak uh, preach, I was thinking about two people. Um, first one I was thinking about was Billie Holiday and someone who, I mean, the first time I became aware, I understood knew who she was. I was probably in high school, right? Uh, I watched a documentary, The Lady Sings the Blues, with her and Billy, uh, Diana Ross. <laughs> That's my first introduction to her, right? And then the Strange Fruit song was obviously prominent. And then watching the most recent documentary, I mean, uh, movie, I believe it is, on whatever station it was, yeah. not really understand. I kind of got a better understanding of the of the purpose of her use, singing that song, yeah. right? Yeah. Strange Fruit, and how large a role it played in the US government wanted to take her down and so many other things, but she understood. The point I'm gonna to get to, like she understood her role. She was entertaining people, she was in the club, she was partying, she was doing, she was being a full human being. Full and human. she understood that she had a platform and that this song people needed to hear, right? Because it was illuminating an issue that impacted her community, her black folks. It was her way to communicate just like we've been using music. She was a griot in the, in the greatest sense, right? And, yes. and, and and the second person I'm thinking about is James Baldwin, right? We, you know, we think about artists and some of our greatest artists. Um, he has a quote that says, paraphrasing the precise role of the artist is to, uh, to make the world a more human place, more human dwelling place, yes. right? Um, and he was somebody who interacted regularly with other artists in different genre in terms of music, et cetera, actors. He was a, he was a, a artist in his own right, obviously as a writer. Um, but music and musicians, right? I think in front, I think it's funny that you can consider myself, I, I see myself in that place. Like we have a responsibility to be our full human selves and in that space, understanding who we are in our full human self. So be, basically I'm a black person in this country, in the world, there's a certain positionality that I have. So while I wanna dance and play and sing and dance, you know, all the fun things, there's a positionality that I also represent and I should be keenly aware of that because I'm transmitting this out to, you know, the masses. Um, and the last thing I'll sort of just add is right in front of us to, in, in terms of like what, to underscore what Priest said in, ter uh, in terms of it being a form of resistance um, a revolution. I was some of our, you know, think about hip hop. It started from some people in, on, on the corners in the projects in the Bronx, poor marginalized black folks, right? And it was something put looked down upon, right? I think about my own background in terms of I played a steel pan and in the TED talk, I talk about it in the book, I write about it a little bit more, but like that's an instrument that's played all over the world and it's in, it's in it's been infused into all types of music. It's the only musical instrument invented in the 20th century. But that was invented in the gutter, in the gutter parts of the country of Trinidad where people looked down upon it. My father played as, as a young person. He was looked down upon by other people by it. But that music is part of the expression of people of the, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the most marginalized. That is one of our tools of communication, right? And I think that you know, music will always be, particularly for marginalized folks, will always be essential. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. That's a very powerful.
And so, go ahead. No, I just was saying, I thoroughly agree with that. And for me, it was one of the reasons that I wanted to go into the Virginia uh, correctional facility uh, jail in order to work with some of what I learned to call the residents on music. Um, I wanted to work with them with music and creativity because I, number one, know that that's my gift. That's where I, that's the lane that I sort of, you know, navigate in primarily. And then second of all, I felt like that's something that I could offer as an expert in that field. And then third of all, I felt like it would give these brothers and sisters an opportunity to express the bottled up emotions in the levels and layers of, in the, the, the layers of onion in a sense that needed to be unraveled and unleashed somehow. And I felt like music from experiencing it my own self, I felt like music is one of those great mediums to do just that. And um, it was more of a powerful experience than I thought it was going to be. And I was hoping that it was gonna be, it was way more powerful than that. So um, thanks uh, uh, for, for sharing that again, powerful insight. Um, I, you, you talk a little bit about uh, being conscious of the platform that you all uh, have. Uh, you know, I mentioned the millions of uh, either viewers or listeners that, that, that you both have and mu musicians uh, have. And, and you mentioned how you are, and, and I don't, I, I guess I would, I would want to know if you were always uh, conscious, both of you in terms of the platform that you had, uh, the influence that you had, because there's been, um, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, musicians like Taylor Swift, uh, more recently Selena Gomez, who uh, started to, uh, you know, express their political views. Uh, uh, in the case of Taylor Swift, uh, much later in her uh, musician's uh, career, Selena Gomez, I guess one would consider still uh, young, but um, was there a point that you all maybe realized or 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 was 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 there always this consciousness of the oppression discrimination police brutality uh all of that um i mean at what point did you became conscious or were you always conscious I, I, i'll just take a jump at it first preach uh i mean i grew up in a neighborhood where all the things were around me so I, it was hard to be unconscious of the things that were happening around me i grew up in a neighborhood where all the things were happening all the violence all the police violence all the things were happening um, so it was hard not to be conscious of it. I think, you know, obviously, and then I went to prison at a young age at 19. Um, but I think there's always, a, I've always, personally, I've always been conscious of these things, right? I, I think, um, and even the type of music I grew up listening to, like I grew up in a household where like things like conscious reggae was played in the house, right? So there was always this sort of, you know, awareness of a bigger picture. Yeah. I think as I got older and had experiences of my own, I started understanding like the, the application of these songs and the music that I was listening to. But I mean, for certain people growing up, you can't be unconscious of it. It's, it's of the issues around you, you know? So, I mean, I don't know how you feel about it, Preach. No, um, it's speech, by the way, speech. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm, no I'm sorry. <laughs> I do preach too. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, um, you know, I agree with you, Ron. I, I totally do. For me as well, I, I grew up, around the issues that the oppressive issues, I grew up around it. The toxicity, I grew up around it. The pathologies, grew up around it. The beauty, grew up around it. So all of those things. But I saw the power of music just in general, not necessarily in a political charged way or even a conscious like consciousness type of way, just the power of music. I saw, early on, my dad owned a nightclub and I would see, because I was behind the scenes, I would see people come into the club and I'd see their mood or their vibe. And I'd see them at the end of the night and I'd see the transformation. All of that because of music and socialization and connecting with other beings through music as the conduit. So I, I saw the power of music early on. Me deciding to be a part in positive change and, and a force in that, in that regard came from two things. One was 
my parents, similar to Marlon, who listened, his family and his household was listening to conscious uh, reggae. My parents were in the publishing game. My mother is a newspaper publisher. She owns the largest black newspaper in Wisconsin to this day. Mm. And it's called the Milwaukee Community Journal. Mm. So every, when we would get around the breakfast table every once in a while, mm. my mother and father would talk about the issues in the community and talk about solutions and talk about stories that would make an impact. So I was hearing these things even as a kid, but not necessarily registering it on how to apply it in my own life. I was thinking about girls, I was thinking about clothes, I was thinking about money, just the things that young kids think about. Then I would hear other artists as I got older, like a public enemy, that would start speaking about the Panthers or Farrakhan or Chesimard. And I'm like, who are these people? What is this? And I started to become more aware that there was some way I could apply the things that I've seen in my life in a more effective way to affect change. And that's what I wanted to do. I realized that probably at age 19 or 20, somewhere in there. Mm. And so for me, it was a big deal. And even to this day, I'm a big believer in an ounce of prevention beats a pound of cure. So I've mm. always been someone that strives to create culture of change in music, in lyricism, in artistry, so that some people will never have to go through what a speech went through in order for me to become conscious or what a Marlon went through in order for him to become conscious, that it just is be, that it's something more um, accessible at an early age and it's more, and therefore it could prevent a lot of the things that we're having to deal with and talk about even on this uh, platform today. So that's one of the things that I'm passionate about as well. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you for sharing the evolution of uh, this consciousness. I, I guess in, in, in some sense, uh, you know, um, I guess what I just described, the experience of Taylor Swift and Selena Gomez, perhaps as more privileged artists, um, maybe, or uh, you both uh, talked about how um, basically the, the music industry, it, it's, it's got this stronghold on, if, if you have a representative, for example, they don't want you to uh, a state of political opinion because of fear of uh, uh, album sales uh, or ratings uh, not being there. So um, I wanted to follow up with um, uh, another question. What role do you see this medium playing, whether it's music, uh, filmmaking, documentary making? Uh, uh, what role do you, do you see this medium playing in national movements such as Black Lives Matter, for example, voting rights, particularly in Georgia, immigrant rights, uh, or environmental movements? Um, how, how do you see music uh, fitting in uh, or not? I mean, uh, for example, I mean, are, are some of these uh, activist leaders, how, do they reach out to you as, as musicians or as writers to, you know, uh, collaborate? How do you see this? You want to you want to hit that Marlon first or? No, you go ahead. Uh, okay. uh, speech. Um, for me, I think that it's ultra important. I mean, what was the '60s if it wasn't for songs like "What's Going On" by Marvin Gaye or songs with Jimi Hendrix and and Sly and the Family Stone stand or so many songs. I mean, from folk songs to rock songs to R and B songs and on and on and on. What would the '60s have been? Take away that music. Um, for the 90s, which to me was sort of a mirror of the 60s, the early 90s and the late 80s. What would the late 80s have been without a public enemy or an arrested development or a tribe called Quest or so many others? You know, and even from the television and movie standpoint, what would the early 90s, late 80s have been without a Spike Lee's do the right thing or, you know, so on and so forth. So these, these mediums, meant so much to that era and defined for that era so much of the conversation, the, the, the movements and the things that people were passionate about. So I think that it's ultra important in this day and age, possibly even more so because mediums now reach more people than ever before. I mean, Marlon was speaking earlier about his use of a Walkman 
And I totally relate to that. I remember eight tracks. I might be older than Marlon. I don't go that far back. (laughs) (laughs) I remember eight tracks. I remember vinyl, cassette, CDs, all of these different amalgamations. But now today, you got MP3s or what have you who are going out on the internet where the entire planet can be moved or touched. Even this very broadcast we're doing now, if we chose, if it if it was possible, well, it is possible that the entire planet could watch this at one time, pretty much. And so, um, well, at least a lot of the planet. So the point <laughs> is, is that more than ever, songs of protest or songs of, um, you know, resistance need to be part of the narrative. Um, of this day and age, because the problems are reaching more people than ever before, and the solutions can as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, artists, artists, uh, artists organize societies. I mean, I don't think we think about it in that way, but societies are organized by artists, whether or not we want to uh, give them that credit or not, whether they want the credit or what have you, but, you know, artists organize society. So, and artists, as we have spoke about before, artists organize revolution too. You know, you have a, if you look to any of the revolutionaries in the past who we may hold up, see who they're in conversation with, right. <laughs> see who they were talking talking to. You will always find them speaking to one of these other artists of other types, whether it be music, whether it be uh, whatever multimedia art, you know, whatever it is, they were always in conversation with it. So, I mean, I think about in a contemporary moment now, we think about, you know, we just sort of think about Netflix, right? I'm not, you know, but like there, there is a Black Stories thing on Netflix now, right? Like there's a black stories thing. And that's a direct result of organizing in our streets, mm-hmm. right? And, and I'm not trying to put a crown on that particular entity, but I'm just saying that in terms of media, like it is always, I always say this media, whether it be, in, and the way artists use media, I always say media is like the, the fourth branch of government, but it has no checks and balances, right? And I, and I think about that in terms of music as well as the, the, the literary, uh, the, the written word. It's the thing that impacts all of us the most. So when you see a young kid on, on outside singing a song or a rap song, he, she, they, they are being impacted by somebody, some artistry. And we, they don't articulate it that way. We're not in the street with our, you know, with our headphones now, with our beats on, and we're like, oh, I'm being impacted by a certain artist, right? No, they're not saying that, but there is a message in that they are getting, but it's also, it is, it is. You think about music in a place of, of in, a, in a in a space of romantic uh, uh, realm, right? And you, you understand the emotion that a certain song will bring when you think about a person, uh, you know, what have you, right? That instills an emotion, whatever it is. And let's hope, I mean, let's say it instills a good emotion <laughs> for the sake of this conversation, right? <laughs> but in the same way, though, other type of forms of protest, not only not only overt songs of protest. But I think about Biggie in a sense, right? And I think about him in the sense of, yeah, this, you can look at, listen to Biggie and you say it can, people can crit- critique it in various ways. I'll just leave it at that. But it was also in so many ways, an understanding, uh, um, to me, it was an analysis of a certain environment. It was, it, was a, it was a political analysis. Now he didn't say that. And maybe at the time, I don't know. I never, I don't know Biggie, maybe he didn't, I don't know what he knew, but I do know that, I'll give you an example. I know, do know one thing that one of his earliest performances were organized by uh, some people out in my neighborhood, um, Monifa Bandele, Lumumba Bandele, who's been a part of the Black liberation work for decades now, who were instrumental in the Free Mamiya campaign back in the 80s and 90s. Mm-hmm. And I know that he was one of, that was one of, he, he performed with them, through them early in his career. So what I'm saying though, is this, I mean, just reaffirming the same thing that, uh, that, uh, that, that speech has been saying that, you know, music has and will always be the, the mechanism by which we attain freedom. How about well, memoirs? Like the one you wrote? <laughs> well, let's see. I, you know, let's see. Well, I personally think that these, like writing is yeah. just as important in the sense that it literally transports people into an experience that they didn't have to go through themselves. And so now well, they get a chance to to experience to some extent Marlon's life and to grow from it, learn from it, be, um, you know, be disturbed by it, whatever it is going to do, it is going to have an effect on who they are. I'll tell you from my only personal experience, hearing you share from the chapter in your book today had an impact on me 
right off the bat. And it had a visceral just reaction in my spirit because you shared it. So yeah, I definitely agree that. And what I what I love about, you know, whether it's writing music or literary or movies or what have you, is it's similar to investing. You're making money while you're asleep. You're in, you're making an impact, Marlon, on people while you sleep. Someone else is being moved. It's not like you have to show up in a room and make an impact on 200, 500, whatever amount of people. You could be sleep, chilling out with your girl, whatever, <laughs> and someone else is being moved by something that you've done. And that's what I love about the residual effects of this kind of medium. So if I could jump in real quick with that before you go, uh, Dr. Garcia, I think about everyday people. I mentioned that earlier. One of the, over the last couple of years, uh, it was like a, is a party circuit, right? And they call it everyday people. I don't know if you're familiar with it, right? But, that you know, right. so you, you might want to talk to people about that, but <laughs> that's a whole other thing. But, but their parties are very much about infusing activism um, around issues of, of race and gender and things of that nature. Like they call it everyday people, they're fun and wonderful, but they're always infusing that. And I'm just trying to speak into what you're saying about me and that, you know, a song that you made decades ago it's still living in a way in which people are using entertainment as you were using entertainment in the same way you use it to also inspire and move and, and, and help liberate folks. Agreed, agreed, yes. So I have, have two questions uh, and I know we're, uh, there is, I, I think we may have about 10 more, more minutes, 10, 15 more minutes. Uh, so I guess if, if we're running out of time, just uh, if, if you can send me a quick uh, text, but the, the two last questions that I have, obviously relate to both. Uh, the first one, um, the, the first one, uh, uh, Marlon would be, uh, what would you recommend for uh, maybe other uh, people who haven't written memoirs? And of course, I, I've been uh, thinking about writing a memoir since like 10 years ago, and it just never uh, done it. But what would you recommend um, for those uh, viewers, listening uh, audience out there who want to uh, uh, write a memoir? Uh, what what advice would you give them? Um, and then uh, uh, for you, speech, um, what do you recommend for amateur artists like the, the, the like those that you uh, profile in the documentary 16 Bars? Uh, and, and even those who are not necessarily institutionalized, uh, who have an interest or cu curiosity or perhaps, I mean, obviously talent uh, to record music and do something uh, for the good of society. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I say write. I always tell people write. I think that you should write it. You know, the, the memoir process or writing a memoir is primarily a... Um, it's a documentation of your experience. Like this is this is what future societies need to understand, right? Future societies need to understand how everybody lived in that particular society. That's why we study the past. Now we don't just go read the documents of all all empires and governments. We try to find whatever poems or whatever stories, whatever handwritten notes on walls, whatever thing was written, because that's how we better understand the society. So I mean, that's one thing on a like on a macro level. But I also think. You know, particularly in in the in the, in, in, the, in, the in a personal space. You know, writing out your story, whether you write it to get published or not. I think writing out your story is is healing for the individual. You get to understand a little bit more about yourself when you go through the process. And at the very least, if you have children or grandchildren or nieces or nephews or what have you, they get an understanding of also their family history, right? That's a family. That's a record of family history. That's the one you don't have to go to ancestry.com to go to, right? So uh, you know what I mean. So I. I I always encourage people to write, particularly black and brown folks. Like we need to over to overflow with stories with our records and our lives. I mean, how else do we understand? And you know, we think about slave narratives of the 18, 1700s, 1600s. I mean, where would we be without those records, those documentations? We need that. So I think that person, there's so many benefits to it. I also advise that you have a therapist while you're doing it. <laughs> but I do suggest though that. You know, I encourage people to write. I think writing is, I mean, that's, once again, that's how, that's how societies are organized. Awesome. Thank you. So I, I could not agree more with what Marla just said. Um, there's so much I could say about this, but I would say that, you know, we come into this world and it's all new to us. And I'm talking about newborn. <laughs> and we don't know anything. We're, we're learning, we're adapting to everything. Everything is new. And one of the first things we're trying to do 
is understand this world. And one of the first things we look to is others, whether it be our mother, our father, our relatives, or somebody. We're looking to somebody else to help us explain what this is that we're experiencing. And that's why I think that writing, whether it's literary, movies, music, whatever, is so deeply important because mm -hmm. every one of us have a unique story, but it also helps everyone else understand their own story and how they fit into this grand scheme of this amazing experience that we are presently in. And so it is so important to write. And what I would suggest to younger artists or artists that haven't really maybe put pen to paper yet or what have you, is to be sure to speak your story. What moves me about Marlon's story so much is that it's his experience and that's what I wanna know. I know what I'm going through. I know what some people around me are going through but I don't know what he's going through. And if I could get a window into his life, his experience, then I am further enlightened to what others are going through. Mm. So, so many artists, especially when capital gain is sometimes the only incentive of why they're doing art, they will follow other artists and try to be, you know, make it or get big by copying others when in truth, their secret success is in their personal story, what they have been through, the unique realities that they offer this world by sharing their truth. That is what I think the world needs to hear more of. And I think it has a huge impact, not only on those in this era, but as Marlon was suggesting in earlier this conversation in eras to come. And for black and brown people, just to touch on what he shared, you know, historically, African nations and, and Eastern civilizations from ancient times, their stories have been wiped out, but their, their, their philosophy, mathematics, um, science was so high. And all of that has been wiped out in this era. We don't even teach it in schools. And so people in the future who will understand what ancient times, how advanced they were in ancient times, and yet how oppressed we are in this time will be baffled how <laughs> things can flip upside down so thoroughly. When in truth, people of color have had such a huge impact on the history of the planet the people of all races originating from black people or people of color, and yet civilizations and so on and so forth, mathematics, so many great accomplishments of civilization come from people of color. And yet we are so oppressed in this day and age. That is just a study in and of itself. That's mm -hmm. why I think so many people do need to write about what we're going through because it's an anomaly. It is a, in the big gist of things, this is a very weird time for people of color. And I think that people need to study this time to try to hopefully in the future, never come back to this weird time. There wasn't even a white race until I think it was like the 1600s, like the term white people wasn't even a thing. It might've been the 15 or 1600s. So my point is, is this whole white supremacist era that we're presently in, that will indeed end. It will come to a close. It is a weird time in the history of humankind. And I think, people that are living in this particular area, these are the cards that we've been dealt, all of us on this conversation and those watching. I think our stories are so valuable to the future generations of this world. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I guess, uh, you know, I, I really don't have any other questions prepared. I mean, there was one, but I, I don't know how well it'll fit here, but I wanted to ask if, uh, other than yourself, share uh, with us some of the Black artists that are uh, on the front lines on, on this matters, uh, obviously uh, voting rights, civil rights, uh, pu putting their lives, careers perhaps on the line to, to advance these movements. Uh, uh, I know you, uh, you mentioned uh, some, I think in, in, in the beginning uh, of the conversation, maybe, I mean, do you know some black artists who were exiled from the US for being anti-government in the sixties or, or, you know, anything uh, about black artists uh, that, uh, you know, perhaps got in trouble government for being critical of the government? Yeah, I always go first, you go first. Uh, <laughs> go ahead, bro. 
Okay. Um, I think about, I'm going in the past, right? I think about Claudia Jones. And Claudia Jones, um, if you know globally, she, and so in Harlem, she, uh, she immigrated here as a young child from the Caribbean and she, you know, set, you know, set up shop with her family in, in, um, in Harlem and became a huge activist and very much critical of the United States, United States government. Um, so much so that they arrested her because they considered, you know, uh, you know, uh, label her as a communist and they deported her to England. Just think about that. She's from the Caribbean, but they deported her to England for the, because they felt that in the Caribbean, she was too close to them. There's not enough, they can't, watch over her enough she can incite trouble. So she went to London and incited more trouble and started the first one of the first black newspapers over there um, and started Notting Hill Carnival, like the you know the carnival that people go to London for. And she was all but you know in her earlier in her earlier work she was considered a militant. And for a woman to be considered a militant at that time, you know, obviously people look down upon her for various reasons, but she was before Malcolm X. I just want to like give that right. She was before Malcolm, like so in that place of Harlem. You think about a neighborhood that was her big home, and that was his big homie. I kind of like think about that. Like people like Claudia Jones was his big homie, and she got deported. And I do want to lift people like her up because she wasn't an artist in the sense of like, well, she was an artist in every sense of the word, right? She wrote, she lectured, and she saw a whole ass carnival, <laughs> right? A whole carnival that existed today. So I think about Claudia Rankin and kind of like moving forward though. I mean, I think there's. I would want to trouble or problematize the idea that artists and activists are two separate entities, right? Whatever the type of artists are, like they're two separate now. The, the, you know, the output of the product you produce may have, may be a little bit different at times, but I don't know if this if this distinct or they're really distinguishable, right? You're still creating emotion and 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 for people. No matter where you, no matter what type of artist you are. So in this day and age, I mean, I think I, I don't know if folks are necessarily exiled in the sense of how like a Claudia Jones were, but there are various ways when folks are exiled in terms of access, you know, the type of deals they get and all those sort of things. So the, the exiles may look a little different from the way they look back, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. I don't know if you got to you think about it, uh, uh, please. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. And and there is a different type of exile in this day and age. So you know, groups like that we're all aware of have had their own form of an exile. So groups like Public Enemy, for instance, who I'm friends with them, um, they're some of my musical heroes. Their impact is undeniable, millions of albums sold, but their access, if they release a record today, the access that people have to that record and the knowledge that people will have of that record is way less, and I mean, so much less that it feels like an exile um, mm. in this day and age. But even going back, Billie Holiday, the, the new documentary that Marlon was exuding, you know, alluding to, it's called um, The United States versus Billie Holiday. Well, during her entire existence, there was this fight for what song she can and cannot sing. Other uh, entertainers, not necessarily artists like Muhammad Ali, obviously his title was stripped from him because of his views. Um, you know, whether it be Marcus Garvey, who's a speaker or orator, who was attacked from a taxes standpoint. So on and on and on, Arrested Development, our access to the mainstream has been limited. Uh, a friend and artist, uh, a friend and artist of mine named Paris, who's a very political artist, same difference. Um, his access to the mainstream has been extremely limited. All of these are techniques to squelch that type of messaging in a mainstream sense. Okay, so the and in other artists who don't have that same type of messaging can be pushed upwards and they have more access than ever before. Um, what I would like to see is all artists like it was in the early 90s where artists like a two live crew who's going to talk about freedom of speech and strip clubs and big booties was on the same tour as a public enemy mm. who's talking about fight the power who's on the same tour as an mc hammer who's dancing his butt off and just having a good time like all of this type of energy was coexisting at the same time and on the same access level and that's what to me um is artistry at its best yeah i'm kind of wondering what that would look like now if we had a tour with you know i don't know cardi b and um 
I don't know, I'm trying to think of some of the, you know, Kendrick, I mean, Kendrick Lamar and all those type of folks on the same tour. And, and, and how is a society, particularly as a progressive society, how would we feel about that, right? Because, you know, the way you, what you spoke about just now is like how we look back and we're like, wow, that was a great thing. But I'm wondering, like, at that point in time, at that point in, in the early mid 90s, when people saw that headline with a two live crew and let's say even with, 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 with the rest of the development, whoever, like, how critical were people of that at that point in time as we look back and we can romanticize it? Because like even in this current moment, I think about, you know, the, the critique that Cardi and Megan the Stallion got for their, their recent performance. Um, in present, in real time, we're not generally, and I say we generally, are not understanding the utility of them and the way they communicate to folks and what they're communicating to people in this point in time as people of color. I just wonder, like, do you think in this present time, do we have to wait until we go into the future to appreciate what could be done now? I, I, I feel what you're saying. And I, I, I go to, to young uh, students at grade schools and middle schools to speak. And when I go, what I'm overwhelmingly impressed by is that young people are very aware of the propaganda that is being delivered to them in mainstream music and media. So in other words, they're very aware that they're gonna hear WAP by Cardi B and Meg Thee Stallion, but they're not gonna hear Ciroc, who's another female MC who speaks about more conscious things, or Rhapsody, who's another female MC hmm. that speaks about Rhapsody. more conscious things. They're not gonna hear her. They're very aware of it. I've done a documentary called The Nigga Factory where I talk about this, this um, sort of magnifying of one aspect of black culture and this demagnifying or sort of tossing away into the dark edges, this other sector of black culture. So young people are very aware of it. They do know that to some extent they're being bamboozled and not given the full voice of expression, all the different viewpoints. And so I think they would be celebratory about it. I think young people would see that this is the community where yes, you're gonna get a WAP or whatever you know that offering is. And at the same time, you're gonna get the equivalent of a fight to power or it's gonna be all right by Kendrick Lamar, whatever the, the new version of that kind of energy is, you're gonna get all of that because that is what our community is. And I think that people will celebrate it. That's my personal view. Thank you. Um, so, hey, I, I'm going to confess something to you both here. Um, you know, academics, I think, in general are, are in, in a little bit jealous of how artists like yourselves get a lot more, uh, you know, uh, of their work out there. And, and, and you know, I mean it in, in the most positive way. So, so because of that, I mean, I'm thinking that, hey, you know, uh, rather than a boring academic book, uh, you know, maybe a, a, a autobiography or a memoir, or or maybe some fiction writing will will probably most uh, will get a lot more audience, or maybe uh, doing a documentary uh, a lot more audience than some obscure article or book. So um, I respect greatly the work that you both uh, do. Um, you know, I thank you for uh, both you, Marlon, and Speech for making this uh, pa uh, panel. Uh, an awesome uh, experience uh, for all and, and for engaging in uh, this very, uh, what I think, uh, in engaging conversation. Um, I mean, I don't know if, uh, if there's any last uh, thoughts that you both want to offer uh, for uh, our audience out there. Um, I think this would be a, a good opportunity to do that. I'll let Speech get the last word. <laughs> I think he deserves the last word. So let me jump in first. Um, first of all, I want to say apologies for calling you preach. <laughs> no problem. Super nervous. <laughs> and it kept coming out. And I was like, it was just lodged in my head. So I want to apologize. For but you do preach, like you said. That's and, true. Uh, and, that's, <laughs> and I associate you with that in, in, in our legacy of music and hip hop and artistry. So I appreciate that. Um, I just want to say, Dr. Garcia, that like, I'm, I'm, I, I, I rocks with academics. Like, I, I think, you know what I'm saying? I think about Kimberly Crenshaw, right? Kimberly Crenshaw is a great friend. And she's an academic, but she's also fun as hell. Like I've hung out with her and all that sort of stuff. But she's also, and she's somebody who, who she's informed our artistry now. Yeah. Like that whole idea of intersectionality, as much as it might be seem like this really brainy academic concept. And don't get me wrong, 
Kim Crenshaw could probably run laps. She definitely run laps around me. But the point though is that, like her art, her her academic work is part of the artistry that we use now in our work. It's why somebody like a Cardi B is affirmed now, right? It's, that's because of her work. So I'm just saying, like, don't shoot yourself in the foot, Doctor Garcia. You are, you know, what I'm saying, like, I could, that, that's all part of the word. Like Maya Angelou, who deeply inspires me and. You know, bird and cage obviously said words are a thing. They are a thing. So whether it come through in with some with some with some melody behind it, whether it comes from a pulpit, whether it comes from the street corner, wherever it comes from, whether it comes from a from an academic reading, like uh, it's the thing. You're, you're, we are transmitting things to each other. So I mean, with that being said, I mean, thank you for allowing me to be in conversation with you, sir. And thank you definitely, thank you definitely, Speed, for allowing me to be in conversation with you. Same with me, Marla. Thank you uh, very much for allowing me. And Dr. Martin, I, I appreciate what you shared, but I, like Marlon said, I think we all really appreciate, or at least all of us on this panel especially appreciate the academic world because you all study this. So it's, it's one thing to, to have the emotional capacity and the ability to get people to, to, to connect with it emotionally. And there's another thing to have studies behind it. And I love it. I've always respected it. Some of my best years of my life was when I went to college and it was only because people were always in a learning mode. And I just love that whole energy. So I have deep respect for it. And a lot of the groups that I most respect sort of always go back to some type of academic speech or something in part of their songs in order to sort of nail the, the point of what they're trying to say. Public Enemy was a great example of that, had various speeches of different academics and people um, in that realm. So I always have respected that and I do it too. So yeah, thank you. Thank you all for bringing this whole thing together, which again is another attribute to the academic world. Thank you so much. All right, so I'll hand it over to Kate or Claire, so. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you yeah, Dr. thank you all so much for being here. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Garcia, for, um, for facilitating this wonderful conversation. This was really great. And thank you, Speech and Marlon, for being with us today. Uh, Speech, this has been a long time coming. We've had you plan to, to come out here to Spokane. That was the original plan, you know, at least a year ago. Um, so we're, we're sad that all of you can't be here with us in person. But like you said, we're so happy that this means that this conversation can reach so many more people. So we're really thrilled about that silver lining to this. So yeah, thank you again for being here. Uh, and for our audience at home, don't forget that you can learn more about today's guests, check out other festival events and donate to help support our festival on our website, getlitfestival.org. Thank you again for joining us. Goodbye, everybody.